off the coast of Africa, there is an oasis, an ancient Eden where nature thrives. Rich equatorial currents sweep across the Indian Ocean and meet the African continent here, bringing food and life, supporting some of the world's richest coral reefs. Dense with tropical adaptations, endless schools of fish, creatures small and large, a teeming cauldron of life. However, even in this remote corner of the world, changes to the climate and oceans are beginning to have impact. And man's need for food and fuel is putting pressure on this delicate realm. It could easily slip away, but a unique partnership is fighting to make sure that that doesn't happen. Local fishermen and conservationists are working together to find a way to preserve and protect this thriving ecosystem for generations to come. And it's changing people's lives for the better. The east coast of Africa is legendary for its abundant schools of fish, beautiful beaches, magnificent coral reefs, and a great diversity of marine animals. Whales, dolphins, turtles, and sharks. But in too many places, this abundance is gone. From Somalia to South Africa, overfishing has taken its toll in the last 25 years. But the island of Amizi and the reefs that surround it have become a refuge and sanctuary for thousands of species. A wild place relatively untouched by the hand of man. Vamizi is part of the Karimbas archipelago, a jewel-like chain of around 30 coral islands just off the coast of Mozambique stretching some 400 kilometers north to the border with Tanzania. And Vamizi is one of the northernmost islands. At just 12 kilometers long and two kilometers at its widest point, it's also the largest island in the chain, with long, untouched beaches, mangrove-lined lagoons, and rich blue waters. It really looks like paradise. Its relative isolation from mainland Mozambique has preserved its wild nature and attracts unique species like humpback whales. They travel thousands of miles from Antarctica to give birth and shelter their calves in these warm, protected waters. They are joined by green sea turtles who travel up and down Africa's coast to seek out these beaches to lay their eggs. Alongside them, more than 400 species of fish live on the sprawling reefs, endangered gray reef sharks being one of many who inhabit these reefs and deep canyons. Man has had a presence in Mozambique and its islands for hundreds, even thousands of years. Swahili and Arab traders sailed their dhows here seeking gold, palm oil, ivory, and slaves. 
Explorer Vasco da Gama dropped anchor in 1498, opening Mozambique up for European commerce and establishing it as a colony of Portugal. Today, Mozambique is a country emerging from decades of war and heavy corruption, which left the economy and the people devastated. But all that is changing. One of the largest natural gas finds in recent history has been discovered off the coast of Mozambique and might bring billions of dollars into the country in the next 20 years. It is turning sleepy villages into boom towns. But thriving coral reef systems like Vimizi are directly in the path of the deep sea drilling. And the threat is loud and clear. A team of scientists and conservationists from all over the world are here working with the local communities to protect the Mizi while the ecosystem is still healthy and strong. Okay, back, 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 neutral, neutral, neutral. We can't move the eggs too much, so have to be as gentle as possible. Oh, I couldn't get there. I had already been down for a minute and a bit. I start swimming, I'm going, I'm not going anywhere. Did you hear them down there? It was great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tessa Hemson has been scuba diving and free diving on Bamiz's reefs for years. So she has a deep knowledge and understanding about how these reefs function. This place is extremely important to me because growing up in Africa, I'm very passionate about the African condition. There are incredibly big challenges in this region. People need to be fed and reefs are declining at a rapid rate. First step for Tessa and the rest of the team is to gather information about the apex predators in this area. The research that, that I'm doing around Vermezi is just basically trying to find out where it is these, these sharks that we have here are going, how they're using our areas, and with that knowledge, then try to construct a conservation um, plan that's actually going to effectively conserve them or give them a really good shot at maintaining their population. In order to track their movements on the reefs, Tessa wants to place tags on several sharks. Once attached, these tags will send out a signal telling her where the sharks go, how deep and how long they stay there. So the scientists will know exactly where to put the boundaries for Neptune's arm, a new marine park. But placing a tag on a moving shark is no easy task. So Tessa is teaming up with a partner who brings special skills to the business of shark tagging. Basically, I was brought in to tag the gray reef sharks using modified spear guns. We're doing it on a single breath of air, free diving. William Winram is a world champion free diver. Like the famous Japanese pearl divers, he dives without scuba gear, using only one single breath of air. And he dives deep, achieving depths of 150 meters and can stay underwater for as long as eight minutes. A few years ago, he started using his skills to support ocean conservation. Using our breath hold skills and our ability to stalk and hunt underwater to sneak up on the animals to place the tags, it has proven in 90% of cases the most effective way. Good morning. Hey, morning. How, How are you? Doing? Good. William is anxious to get a first yeah. look at Vamise's famous reefs and the sharks they'll be tagging. Let's go. 
Okay, so we're good? We got everything? Okay. Yeah, I think we got the bus. Corals have created this entire island, and they're the reason that any of the structure around us exists. So without the corals, you don't have homes for fish, you don't have homes for crabs, you don't have homes for bigger fish that eat the little fish. So the entire ecosystem absolutely depends on those corals being there. The islands of the Carimbas were once part of an ancient Great Barrier Reef that protected this coastline. Over millions of years, continental uplift and receding ocean levels exposed parts of the reef, creating the islands that we see today. But just below these crystal blue waters, they are surrounded by vast magical gardens of coral spreading out over a hundred kilometers. David Obura is a renowned specialist on coral reefs. He's director at Cordio, a program dedicated to the study of coral reefs in this region. Coastline in Mozambique and Burmese Island, it's special in many ways, and we're only really discovering those now in terms of what it means for coral reefs. And it's clear that this is the highest diversity region in the whole Western Indian Ocean. Here in the northern Mozambique Channel, you have these huge circular currents and eddies that set up. And the way they interact with the coastline, they create this really complex islands and banks. And I think that's one of the reasons why you just have so much uh, abundant reef life over here and so much vibrancy. Obura and other scientists believe these reefs may be the cradle of coral, what Obura calls a mother reef. A mother reef is a source reef for other reefs around it. So you have the reproduction of the corals and the fish and other species on the reef gets transported to other places adjacent on the coastline. It's very likely that Bermizi is that. David is diving several reef sites around Bermizi taking samples and identifying different species of coral. His investigation will reveal much about the overall health of the reefs and how well they're able to respond to environmental threats like warming ocean temperatures and pollution, especially during El Nino years. Corals reproduce through spawning. A key indicator in David's research is an event called the Kitakulu, a coral mass spawning usually tied to the full moon during the spring equinox. And corals are hermaphrodites. They have both male and female sex organs. During the mass spawning, the individual coral organisms simultaneously release their eggs and sperm in an explosion of life. The fertilized eggs, now larvae, attach to hard surfaces below the water and eventually grow into new corals. The release of the eggs attract many fish. A mass spawning is very rare and occurs in only a few places in the world. In fact, Bamizi is the only reef in all of Africa where it has been observed. If the mass spawning happens now, it will mean that Bamizi's reefs are strong and continuing to grow, which is vital for this region and for the overall health of coral reefs everywhere. Tess and William are targeting the most spectacular part of the reef, Neptune's Arm, about a 40-minute boat ride from the Mizi. It is rated one of the best dive sites in the world, but the currents here can be strong. Wow, that is ripping. It looks like it ebbs and flows. I mean, now it's kind of flatten a bit, but there's still these big pushing up, upwelling circles. Well, we need to get in and check it out. Yeah. They have entered one of the richest ecosystems in the world, a marine wonderland, a rugged landscape of mountains, canyons, and valleys. Corals tumble down a thousand meter sheer wall 
and the upwelling of cold water from the deep helps keep the coral healthy and the fish population prospering. We have what's called a mammalian diving reflex. It's the same reflex as whales, dolphins, sea lions have. It's just not quite as pronounced. So when you hold your breath, put your face in the water, your heart rate slows. When you start to dive down, your body shunts blood out of the arms and legs and prioritizes it to the heart, the lungs, and the brain to safely prolong your time underwater. So it's almost like we're meant to be in the sea. Just having seen a whole bunch of other reefs in the last two years that I've been studying and traveling quite a lot is coming back here, you just realize what a unique spot this is. The number of really big predatory fish on the reef, the diversity of fish, and how close you can get to them. It really stands out for me now, even more than before, just how unique that is. It's one of the most pristine remaining reefs that actually exist along this coastline. Tessa is on the lookout for the top dogs in this food chain, sharks. Although there are some hammerhead and tiger sharks in the area, the most common shark seen on these reefs is the gray reef shark. This medium-sized shark is typically about two meters long with a splash of white on the tip of its dorsal fin and dark tips on all the others. Gray reef sharks are very social and are known to hunt in packs, their favorite prey, the schools of fish that live in and around the coral reefs. What I have definitely noticed is the drop in the number of sharks from the time when I first came here to now. But sharks are in trouble around the world. Scientists estimate that over 100,000 sharks are killed every day. We have lost more than 90% of the world's sharks in just the last few decades due to overfishing. In fact, this is the last surviving gray reef shark population on Mozambique's coast. And sharks don't bounce back quickly. Gray reef sharks produce pups only every other year, but Tessa believes that the rich reefs of Amisi may be the most important nursery in East Africa for them. We've had a couple of years when we've had little pups there, and that's rare to find a site that sharks are using like that. Breeding sites like that and nursery sites like that are rare. And we get tiny little things. I mean, they're minute, they're so cute. They're like these little tadpoles and super curious and investigative, not ferocious at all. A site like that is key for, for these populations. Sharks and other sea creatures meet up on the reefs daily to get cleaned and groomed. Small fish and shrimp queue up and pick patiently on the larger animals, removing parasites, dead skin and bacteria that accumulate overnight. In return, these small cleaners are off the menu. No hunting and eating the service staff. Even though there used to be many more sharks here, there's a resident pack left. Tessa suspects that they're just swimming and hunting deep which is exactly what she hopes to confirm with the data from the tags. But today again, the currents are running strong. Tess and William decide to return to home base and plan their tagging strategy. From when you got out of it, yeah. yeah okay. 
Closer to the Mizi, David Obure is checking the reefs for a sign of stress or damage. He has so far identified over 300 species of coral growing here. The waters around the Mizi Islands are extra rich. And the reason is because the energy and these circular currents, the eddies, it creates a lot of activity in the water and productivity for the phytoplankton and the plankton and so on. But also what these eddies do is they reach down and they touch the bottom. They go down the continental slope and they pull up nutrients and sediments from the ocean floor and deliver it to the surface. And that creates a huge richness for life in the shallows. Corals can grow to centuries old, and this is one of the most stable tectonic continental coastlines in the world. It's been like this for 150 million years or more. In that time, so much change has happened elsewhere. The dinosaurs have gone extinct, and now we have a lot of coral species being formed in the Indonesian region, and they're coming across in the ocean currents from there. And I think they're mixing with this older fauna of corals from 30 million years ago. And it seems the northern Mozambique channel really uh, is a place where all these species can survive. But most coral reefs are not so lucky. Reefs around the world are experiencing massive die-offs. Under stress from warming oceans, pollution, or even the loss of too many fish, coral expels the algae that gives it its beautiful colors, resulting in bleaching. Reefs can recover, but many die. And David knows that this is a biological hotspot that is completely unique and must be kept alive. Now, when you see the numbers of increasing percentage of reefs are threatened, a decreasing percentage are in really good health, it's because we're adding one impact after another. It's fishing, pollution, climate change. And they don't have enough time to recover from one before the next one happens. Progressively, coral reefs are increasingly threatened around the world. This is an increasingly common sight. What used to be colorful and mind-bogglingly rich, an equilibrium of life and a life support system for humanity, has now turned into an underwater wasteland. Coral reefs are some of the oldest ecosystems on Earth and crucial to the stability of the planet. They are sometimes called the rainforest of the ocean because they not only provide a home for thousands of species, they also protect our coastlines from erosion and slow global warming by pulling carbon dioxide out of the air. In fact, seagrass beds and mangroves also help sequester carbon from the atmosphere. It's all connected. Although a coral reef looks like it's made up of rocks and plants, it is actually a complex structure composed entirely of millions of tiny animals called coral polyps. The stony corals form a hard skeleton of calcium carbonate. When they die, their skeletons remain and new polyps attach to them and grow. Soon, they have created a virtual underwater city. This is prime ocean real estate. Coral reefs make up less than 1% of ocean habitat. Yet, 25% of marine life lives here. Like the blue-spotted stingray or the Napoleon wrasse, high on the IUCN red list of threatened species, garden eels, or Allard's clownfish hiding out in the anemones. And a spotted greasy grouper that watches for predators and prey on the sandy bottom. Nearby, a juvenile blue razor wrasse mimics a bit of debris, swaying 
with a gentle surge. Some residents actually chew on their home. The rare bumphead parrotfish rams its head into the reef, breaking up the polyps for easy snacking. Although they cannot metabolize the coral, so they discharge it. A single bumphead can consume over five tons of coral in just one year, which results in about 100 kilos of sand. Scientists say that these fish are responsible for about 70% of all the sand on the tropical beaches. Another great personality on these reefs is the one that locals have dubbed nuisance. It's not dangerous, just big, curious, and unafraid. Sporting 11 spines down its back and weighing in over 100 kilos, the potato grouper can startle even the most experienced diver. Providing exquisite color in the dark blue or oriental sweet lips, humpback snappers, and schooling bannerfish. The lionfish, whose venomous spines can puncture and deliver neurotoxins. Battalions of neon fusiliers and hundreds of others. Tucked deep inside the reef are some of the stranger inhabitants. Razor-toothed, black-spotted and giant moray eels. Colorful nudibranchs. Graceful creatures with extraordinary adaptations. themselves offer up a stunning variety of shapes and colors. From the regal staghorn and table corals, which are building blocks of the reef, to showy varieties like galaxy coral, fan coral, and cabbage coral. Even in the world of medicine, these reefs are of extraordinary importance, because the diversity among corals is equally amazing on a chemical level. This is one of our most valuable tools to develop new drugs for the future. The local fishing council, composed of fishermen and villagers, help protect the community-run marine sanctuary. Regular patrols conducted by the local fisheries council intercept fishermen and confiscate their fishing gear when they find them fishing illegally. And on these islands, turtles and their eggs have also been a key source of food for islanders. My primary area of work in Bemisi are the sea turtles. We have green turtles nesting on the island, and we've been monitoring them for over 10 years now on a daily basis. And we have hawksbill feeding on the reefs around the island, which we will start to monitor soon. About 1,500 people live in three villages on the Mizi, all located on the eastern tip of the island. They are called the people of the coast, or Mawani people. Life is traditional here. Most people make a living by catching fish from their dugout canoes or small dhows. There are a few small gardens, but crops are limited because there's no fresh water on the island. Every drop the community uses must be brought in daily by boat from the mainland. In 
In 2006, fishermen from Tanzania and other Mozambique provinces began to fish the rich waters of Amisi's reefs. Alarmed that their fish stocks would be depleted, the local fisheries council declared a three kilometer no fishing zone around Bemisi. And people are also very engaged in turtle conservation. She just had, she can see. Yeah. Is that what that is? Sea turtles have very amazing life cycles from being little hatchlings born on the beach. They end up in the sea and they swim for days until they reach deep waters uh, and hide in algae beds. Well, they will stay for a few years until they grow. Then they will move to their feeding habitats for a few decades. It takes two or three decades to reach sexual maturity, after which they will go back to the beaches where they were born to mate and nest and to start the cycle all over again. And that's where the local communities come in, to help locate, monitor, and protect the nests, so the hatchlings have a chance to make it to the sea. We started by working with the communities and seeing how the population was growing. They themselves became the biggest protectors of sea turtles, and still to this day, they will tell you how important it is to keep the turtles around, and they are the ones that love them the most. Each year, humpback whales set off one of the longest migrations in the world, traveling thousands of miles from the frigid waters of Antarctica to come here to the protected bays and lagoons of the Mozambique Channel to breed and give birth. Averaging 50 meters long and weighing anywhere from 25 to 40 tons, these giants of the deep were hunted to near extinction before international whaling bans went into place in the 60s. Now their numbers are slowly on the rise. They can frequently be seen here drifting on the surface and resting. Melinda Rekdahl is a marine biologist with the Wildlife Conservation Society in New York, specializing in whales. She's come here to find out more about the health and migrations of the humpbacks in these tropical lagoons. Calves need warm water. They, they don't really want to be born down in Antarctica where they might have cool water. So they don't have a lot of reserves, obviously, fat stores themselves. So they come and give birth up here. Jalika Inteka, a researcher from Universidad Lurio in Pemba, keeps a data log on all sightings and contacts. It's clear the whales are coming here in big numbers. By taking small skin biopsies, the team can learn about their overall health, where they're going, and what draws them to these calm lagoons. Melinda has brought an old technology to her high-tech work. A crossbow fitted with a small dart that strikes the whale below its dorsal fin and extracts a small skin sample before falling into the water. It's about a centimeter plug taken out from the whale and it's a, you know, it's a massive animal, usually up to 15 meters, so I think it's more of a mosquito bite. Melinda is concerned that the whales may be the first to feel the impact from the deep sea drilling for gas. Loud noise in the water can shatter their peaceful world. There's a lot of noise generated from oil and gas activities, strandings that have been loosely associated at least with um, potential large sources of noise. There's kind of two effects it can have. It can have a physiological effect and harm them by damaging their hearing, or it can have this social effect where it's um, affecting how they can communicate and 
carry out their day-to-day -day lives and important activities that are really critical to their survival. There we go. I think it is a mother and calf. 500 metres. Yeah. Take it very slowly. They're very quiet. The calf's lying across her rostrum. Careful. Careful. It's fantastic. We've really seen so many whales here. A lot of mothers and calves, whales that have just stayed in this bay over multiple days and really shows us that this is a, a unique area. It's, it's obviously really good habitat for the whales. Whales are continuing to arrive and Melinda is confident she'll be able to get good samples that will tell the tale of where these whales are going and how to protect them. Full moon is a sign that the Kitakulu, the coral mass spawning, may happen soon. But it's a secret affair, occurring only at night, and no one knows exactly what triggers it. Ten minutes after sundown, the daytime fish have scurried to shelter, and the nighttime carnivores come out to feed and breed. Lionfish, scorpionfish, moray eels, sharks and others take the night shift. Some fish change color, darkening to camouflage themselves. Others change their entire bodies, like this dog-faced pufferfish, which becomes an unappetizing ball of spikes when threatened. Most tuck themselves into crevices in the reef to rest and to avoid to become the night's snack because the nocturnal hunters are on the prowl. Some have bigger eyes to absorb as much light as possible as they watch and wait for prey. This scorpion fish makes itself look like part of the reef an effective ambush predator. Sharks use their keen sense of smell and their sensitive electroreceptors just below their skin to detect their targets. Some creatures team up to catch dinner. For corals, finding the next meal is a little easier. Without leaving the comfort of home, they extend their tentacles and feed on the night's plankton feast as it drifts down from the surface. But even as the light goes out, other lights begin to wink on as some of the reef animals begin to glow brightly. This effect, called bioluminescence, is a chemical process similar to what happens in a glow stick. There are many likely reasons for this strategy. Scaring or alerting predators, finding a mate, or even feeding. To the human eye, it resembles neon fireworks.
but with the first rays of sun, the creatures of the night scuttle back into their hiding places and the day begins again. The stakes are high, and Tessa and William are anxious to start tagging sharks at Neptune's. To tag these sharks, we have an amazing opportunity at the moment with William Winram and he's got a fantastic skill. Using a spear gun, implants a tag just next to the dorsal fin of the sharks. So he tags it without having to catch the shark, without having to bring them to the surface. We can avoid all that stress and in the regular tagging process where we'd normally have to exhaust a shark to get it up to the surface and tag it. So he just dives down, gets close enough to the sharks and then tags them. So you want to take that off? My hands are wet. So it's Once the tag is in place on the dorsal fin of the shark, it will start sending out a signal which is picked up by receivers placed throughout the reefs. Scientists will be able to track where the shark goes and better understand its behavior. Okay, we'll grab the gun once we're in the water. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Three. One, three, two, three. The currents are still running strong, and since the shark population in the entire Western Indian Ocean is diminishing, sharks are harder now to find and approach than ever. Tez and William decide to use scuba gear today, allowing them maximum time underwater to find and tag a shark. They descend into the canyon fortress of Neptune's arm and begin their search. Tess and William know that the sharks often hang out deep during the day, but gray reef sharks rely on ram ventilation, water forced over their gills to get air. That means that they must swim constantly in order to breathe. They're hoping that a few hungry or curious sharks will venture into the shallower depths today. It's a game of hide and seek. And then suddenly, it's done. They have their first tag. Yeah, that was great. Jeez. It worked. It was amazing when we got in. I couldn't see anything. No idea where the boat had gone. The visibility was like maybe a meter and a half. And then I lost you. And I was like, shit, where'd you go? You were above me. Because I got in and I emptied the thing. I was like, the team is elated. They have managed to collect data on two of the largest species here the gray reef shark and the humpback whale. As night falls, there's more good news. Fishermen are reporting that they're seeing the first release of the coral spawning. The Kitakulu has begun. This unique event is rarely seen and almost never filmed. No one knows how the corals coordinate, 
but scientists believe that they may release a chemical which allows them to smell each other spawning. Whatever the secret is, it has worked tonight. The massive release of eggs and sperm resembles an underwater snowstorm. Ocean currents will spread the material over a broad area, encouraging healthy genetic mixing. And the sheer volume means that a good percentage of the new larvae will survive the night's predators. Vamizi is one of only a handful of coral reefs in the entire world where mass spawning occurs. It confirms that the reefs are healthy and can continue to act as a mother reef locally and globally. It's very possible if this is the only place that that happens, then for sure those coral larvae are seeding other reefs all over the East African region. And that's unheard of in East Africa. The corals aren't the only creatures active at night. Little turtle hatchlings poke their snouts out of their shells and struggle toward the big sea. These babies are the next generation of green sea turtles, just a few of the 6,000 born on the Mizi this year. They face a tough journey, and worldwide, only about one in a thousand of these young turtles survive to adulthood. But the conservation team working with the villagers are helping them beat the odds so they can come back here in 30 to 40 years and lay their eggs in safety. This little girl goes down to the sea and there's this old man that comes down for his morning walk as well. And there was a storm the night before and all these starfish have been washed up on the beach. And uh, the little girl's walking along and she's picking up the starfish and throwing them back in the sea. The old man eventually catches up with her and says to her, you know, little girl, what are you doing? There are thousands of starfish on this beach. You're never going to make a difference. And she picks up a starfish and throws it back in the sea and says, for that starfish, I made a difference. And that's it. Their mission has been successful, but it's just one chapter in a long-term commitment. Bermizi is really an island of hope. Going diving here and seeing the health of the corals after having some of them being impacted by global warming in one place, unimpacted in others, they are really rebounding back like I haven't seen in many other places. The reefs in this region are a real hope for the rest of the Western Indian Ocean, in fact. The key is partnership. The gas industry is just taking off. Projections are that the reserve below the seafloor holds three trillion cubic meters of gas, making Mozambique a major player in the global market. The economy and the population are booming. Working together, the local fishing council and the conservation team aim to make sure that growth happens in a sustainable way. New data is coming in from the shark and whale studies giving the team fresh information about what these animals need to survive and thrive here. The coral reefs have been here for millions of years, long before man walked the earth. Protecting them, preserving their beauty, is a crucial investment towards a sustainable future that impacts not only this region, but every place and every living thing on this planet, from London to Mumbai, to Buenos Aires. If the community, together with the conservation team, can find a way to balance the needs of nature and the needs of man, 
They hope to keep the reefs strong and flourishing for generations to come. My four-year-old son, he wants to dive and surf and enjoy the sea the way I do. I hope that I can help make it so that it's as beautiful then as it is now. It will be the legacy of our generation, the greatest challenge in human history to save the Earth and thereby to save ourselves. What can we keep and what will we lose? The place to begin is everywhere. The time to begin is now. <laughs>